Have we played this before? Let's make it today then. You can't, this is deliberately hard, you can't move and shoot at the same time. If you can move and shoot at the same time, the game would be easy. There's no goal, is there Brian? Just, uh, just shoot the bug and then you get the highest score and eventually the bug will come down and kill you because you think you've mastered it. <laughs> Alright, you're kind of good at this. <laughs> Just die so we get so that I can die. Right, even with the, uh, you know, few weeks into the course, we have enough code to make this game. Let's talk about what we need to make for this app, right? Now, there are some things I might not go through today. Number one, how to draw that nice font on the screen. That requires a, um, a little plugin for processing, a, a library called Moving Letters, which you can just Google and install. And the other thing I mightn't bother going through today is how to do sound in processing. We'll just concentrate on implementing the core gameplay, right? And we'll see what we need to do. Mm -mm. Oh, we haven't done methods yet, sure we haven't? No. It's okay, we'll do it without methods. We can do it without methods. It's good to have a game. Okay, so we have enough processing code to make this, right? Let's think about what we need. What sort of variables would we need? Speed. Speed of what? Uh, both for the fly itself and the ship. Okay, well let's write them all down. Let's think about what we need to store and, uh, you know, what, what, what was, we need some things to store speed of something. So we definitely need player X and Y. What else do we need? Yeah, we need bug X and Y. What types will they be? Yeah, I would think floats are good. What else do we need? We've got player X and Y, bug X and Y. What other variables would we need? What's that? For the laser? What would we need for the laser? So what would we use to draw the laser? A Just a line. Do we need to store any extra information about the laser? No. Do we need anything else? Maybe we're okay for now. Fire speed it just draws a line, but if it hits the bug, it stops at the bug, it, otherwise it will draw all the way to the top of the screen. Yeah. yeah. The Y position of the... So, no problems. Yeah, so we're either going to use the Y of the bug if we hit the bug, or we'll just use the top of the screen. So we don't need to store a separate variable for that, even though we could, if we wanted to. What else might we need? Absolutely, we need a score variable. Is that everything? The, we definitely need a few time, more. The time that the laser is going to stay on the screen? So the laser just stays on the screen so long as you have the key pressed. If you have the key pressed, the laser will be on the screen. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to worry too much about that. There's definitely a few other things that we know. How will we know if we've hit the bug or not? It's kind of radius. Kind of hitbox. Yeah, how will we know? We'll definitely need to know. <laughs> we have the bug X and Y. We'll also need to know the bug. Mm -hmm. ah. um, yeah, just to know if we've hit it or not. How would I know if I've hit it or not? Like a radius. Yeah, so we need that somehow or other to know the, the width of the bug. So no, if, I, I, if I shoot a laser, is it within the bounds of the bug or not? So we need something for like the bug width. How about when the bug lands? Do we need to know anything there? Do we need to know the player width? 
we probably, we might not need the player width for the game, but it's probably easier if we calculate everything relative to the player width, because if I have a, va a variable for it, it means I can change the player width and the game will work with different size players, you know, so let's put in the player width then as well. So we've got the bug width, the player width, bug x and y, player x and y, the speed and the score. Is that most of everything that we need? Okay, I think this is most of the variables that we need. We may find as we go on and build bits of this game that we might need other variables. Um, so let's think about you know different things that are going to happen. What what are the sort of like the systems in this game? What are the things we would need to code? Control. So we definitely need some way of moving the player. Okay. Do you guys know how to check the keyboard in processing? Can I talk to you about that? So there's several ways you can do it, right? The quickest way to check the keyboard in processing is to check a Boolean variable called uh, key pressed. So key pressed is a Boolean variable. A Boolean variable means what? Uh, true or false. Yeah, it can be either true or false. So that's a Boolean variable that will have the value of true if a key is currently being held down. Okay. To get the actual key that's being held down, you use this variable, key. And that will tell you what key is being held down. So if you want to check, for example, to see if like the, um, the, up, the up arrow key, let's try one of the number keys. Let's try, say, the U key, right? You go, if the key compare things is equals to single quotes U, and that will be true if the key is the U key, okay? So you just check key, press to see if a key was pressed, and then this variable key will tell you which key was pressed. So you can go if key is equals equals to u in single quotes like this, then that will tell you that um, the key is the u key. So um, a quick point, these single quotes here, does anybody know what they signify in programming, single quotes in, in processing or c -sharp? What does it tell you about the thing that's held inside those single quotes? What's its type? Connected. Good guess, good guess. It's actually not a string, but it's very close to a string. It's a single character, right? A string in, in programming is donated by is den denoted by double quotes. A single character is donated by uh, denoted by single quotes. So that's what's called a car. It's it's data type as a car. Wait, wait, you're drawing a face. Look at it, face. Yeah. It's all like happy. <laughs> So, so that's the key. That's how you check the key. What other systems will we need? So now we have some way of, of moving the player. What other systems will we need? What things do we need to do? Um, is that a voice statement or is that we didn't draw? We'll put everything in the draw for the moment. Um, all we're going to use is draw and set up. We could make methods, but we haven't done methods yet, so let's just do draw and set up. Yeah. With the single part with the double quotes, like with the like, well, would the processing be able to read it once you have double quotes and not put like, one there in single string, or is it just because it's a key? If, if you try and use double quotes where it's expecting single quotes, it won't compile. So, for example, if you try and compare a character with, with the double quotes thing, it, it will crash and say, okay, this is meant to be a single character, but you're actually using a string, which is multiple characters. So you have to use the single quotes so like, for um, single characters. Let, let's say if I was to do key space, would I have to do a double quote for space, or would I have to do a single quote? Use single quotes. Quote. So single quote, space, single quote. All right. There are some, because you want to maybe use the up arrows, right? For, for no, things like the up arrows that you can't, there's no key, you can't actually check. <laughs> there's constant. So you use a constant up, down, all uppercase, left, and right. So that's how you compare against those particular keys. Okay. What other systems do we need? Uh, yeah. So we definitely need something for doing collisions. The collisions in this example are pretty, pretty okay because all we do is we check the x coordinate of the laser against the x coordinate of the bug. You know, on the width of the bug, and we'll know if the laser is inside the uh, the bounds of the bug, and we'll know if we've hit the bug or not. So definitely, we need something um, to do with collisions. What other systems do we need? Very simple systems and obvious ones. We need some system for yeah, yeah for respawning the bug and all the rest of it. Okay, so we'll have some sort of hitting the bug sort of thing. Something that you won't need if you were to do this in Unity, of course, would be, but we need it because we're doing processing. 
Regent Buddy? Uh, yeah, well, we, 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 uh, we only use Regent Buddy as a collider track, just in processing. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's how we'll do our collisions. We'll write our own collision code. But what's the thing that, you know, our game's not going to do anything unless we... Fire. Yeah, fire. What else? Move the bug. We need to move the bug, okay? So we're going to have some way of moving the bug. Moving the bug is pretty simple in this one. All I do is I make a random value every certain number of uh, frames, and then I'm going to move the bug to the left or to the right. What else do we need to do? Very first thing we might do. What's the first thing we might do? Now that we've decided all our little systems and all the variables, what's the first thing we're going to do is we've got to draw the bug and we've got to draw the player, okay? So I think if we combine all that together, we might have like the core of the game. There's a couple of other little things we might want to add, okay? So number one is to add what are called game modes. So in this example here, many game modes are there? Many different states are there in this game? Yeah, count them. What happens? Like oh, if we run it again from start, yeah. what are the different modes of interaction? Yeah. There's three modes, okay? So when the game starts off, first of all, it gives you a splash screen. And then once you press space on the splash screen, it goes into the gameplay mode. And then once you're in the gameplay mode and it's game over, we're on the game over screen. So we've got three modes. <clears throat> Alright, so depending on what mode our game is in, we're going to do something different and we're going to check various different things. Does that sound like we've kind of captured most of the functionality of this? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe to start off, let's make a decision, right? So let's think about the player first of all. We'll start off by making the player movement, and then we'll do the bug uh, movement. We could, we could um, very generously call it, we'll program the bug AI, <coughs> right? We'll program some intelligence for the bug, but I mean, to call it AI is a bit... Um, it's very generous because it's not really intelligence of any form at all. So let's let's think about the player then, right? So our player is going to have an x and y coordinate, and our player is probably going to have a width. I think it makes sense for our player to be more or less a square shape, right? Or some sort of a shape. Let's say our player is this kind of shape here. Player width is really the most important. Let's store player width and player height. Um, the next thing we need to decide is, does the x and y, player x and y, does it decide the center point of the player or the, or the left hand side of the player? It doesn't matter, we just need to make a decision. Fire position as well. What? Fire position. Fire position. So I was thinking we could probably just take the player width divided by two. And then that's going to be this x coordinate where we're going to fire from. So we might we might calculate it right from the player width. So the next question is: Do we want um, player x and player y to be the top left hand corner of the player or the center of the player? What do you guys think? We need to make a decision. Okay. Well, let's make a call. It doesn't actually matter which one. You know, just that we need to make sure that when we're doing, for example, our collision detection and stuff, that we know in advance. Yeah, it's the center point of the player or the left hand, because that obviously will affect the the if statements that we write to check the uh, to check for collisions and stuff. Okay, so I think it's I think we kind of have enough to get started and do the first part then, right? So what we need to do then is make our processing sketch. All right, put the void setup and the void draw in. Declare these four variables, which are going to be global variables, because we're going to need to access them throughout the processing sketch, and give them what you think are sensible values. So assign some values to these. And then in your draw method, write the code to draw this player based on these values here, the player width and the player height. Does everybody understand? Okay, so the player width is going to determine how wide the player is. The player height will determine how tall the player is. Let's calculate everything relative to player width and player height. Let's not use any hard-coded numbers so that I can, for example, set player width to be 20 and player height to be 10 and the player gets drawn correctly, or if I set it to be 50 and 20, the player still gets drawn correctly. So we're going to need to do some calculations in how we calculate the x and the y coordinates for each of the individual bits of the player so that we can draw the lines. Does everybody follow that? Alrighty, why don't we try that and see how we get on, right? And let's draw 
the player in this sort of a shape here at the bottom of the screen with a little thing like that for its um, for its gun to her pointing upwards. Let's do that for our first step. How about that? Okay. Everybody know what they're going to do? Yeah. Good. Okay. So let's let's make a call here. We have to decide something before we start to draw this. Do we want just this bit to be the player, or do we want to include the gun turret as well? Uh, just no. the box. Just, just the box. The box. Yeah. I think it may yeah. worse. It make it might slightly easier if it's just the box. Right. If it's just the box, then that's player X and Y. And then I can see this is player X, and I'll go half the width over here to get this X coordinate. And then I also want to go plus half the height to get this Y coordinate. So I'm adding widths and heights and half widths and heights all over the place to figure out those coordinates. So let's, you know, if we, if we analyze this, we end up with, with six lines. Let's, let's write them out. That's one, two, three, four, five, and six. So let's, let's draw them all at one after another and work out the X and the Y coordinates for each one based on what proportion of the width and height they are. So a couple of useful things to calculate. Let's put a comment in here first. And then let's put our code in here. So let's calculate some temporary variables here. Let's call this half width. And that's going to be equal to player width multiplied by 0.5f. So that'll be half the width. And then we'll do the same thing for half the height as well. Because it's kind of useful to have these variables rather than have to put them into the uh, line drawing code. Half height. All right. So now we've half the width and half the height. Let's draw line number one. So for line number one, the x coordinate is going to be player player x minus half the width. Then my y coordinate is going to be player y plus half the height. So that gives me the first two coordinates. Then we have the second two coordinates. So this time we're going to take player x plus half the width. And we'll take player y plus half the height as well. Alright, so that's the line that gets drawn for the bottom of the player. Let's draw line number one. Line number one is the one that goes up the side, right? So this time we can take these two coordinates, because they're going to be the same for the, the start of the line. Now, the end of the line, well, we need to decide what percentage of the... Um, why don't we take 50%? Because then we can use half width and half height for these and see, does that work? God. Yeah, so that should work for these ones. What about these ones here? This maybe needs to be like 25% here and 25% here. How about that? Is that sort of similar numbers to what you guys used? Or what numbers did you use? But one third. Okay. Yeah. You know what I mean. The principle is the same. Anyway. Cool. So there's those guys. So now we're going to take player x minus half the width and player y plus the. Uh, Now, sorry, what did we say here for the Y? What did we want to do? Oh yeah, we want to go halfway up. So that should be just player Y then, huh? Right. <coughs> Let's draw the next bit of the line. So this is going to be line. You might have come up with your own design, and to be honest, it doesn't really matter if your code matches up with this exactly as mine does. It doesn't really matter. So then there's this coordinate for the start of the line number, the line going up the side, and then we want to match this up with um, this x and y coordinate here. So this x we can take, maybe that's going to be the width, that's a tricky one, how do we calculate that one? This coordinate here. How do we calculate the x coordinate here? 
and 25 percent. Mm. Same coordinate as the x, however. No, sorry. Oh yeah. If I just subtract 25 percent of yeah. it from the x coordinate, from the x coordinate, that'll give it to me. Won't it? Player x minus player width multiplied by 0 0.25. Cool. And we got the line at the top. Not forgetting that bracket there. Uh, didn't we forget to put the y coordinate here? That's the player y, and this is going to be player y minus half width, my half height. Okay, so we have player x minus that, and then we also need the player, that's yeah, these two coordinates here. And sorry, we need the second set of coordinates there. Um, what are we drawing here? We're drawing the line that goes across the top. So this is going to be player x plus this value here. A y coordinate is going to be this y coordinate here. Because the y coordinate for this one is the same. I think at this point it's probably a good idea to run the thing and see what it looks like to make sure that we've calculated those correctly. Nothing on the screen? Stroke. Stroke, yes. Yeah. Oh wow, look at that. That's pretty okay. Huh? That's not too far away from what we're looking for. Okay, we'll draw the last we'll draw the last few lines then. Okay, line. So we'll take these coordinates here. And then we will take next coordinates are going to be, where were we? We've drawn, drawn this line here, the next bit then is going to be this line here. So that will be over player x plus half the width. Which is the same as the third line. Plus two. Uh, just work it out. I'm nearly there. We've only two more lines to draw. Player x and then player y. At this point, definitely need to run the program to make sure that I'm doing these correctly. Okay, so we've gone wrong there. We can't just do negative of the previous ones, do no, no, the opposite. Yes, that would be a good idea. Yeah, just copy and paste to make the plus as negative. Uh, what are we doing here? Player X, oh, that should be half width. Anyway, we've only one line to go, so. 99% there. Yeah, let's just draw the last little bit. And yeah, if you want to just copy and paste, that's a good idea as well. You can copy and paste and change the minuses to be plus. And that will work too. So this is going to be this coordinate. And then the last bit is going to be player x plus player width. And then player y plus half height. After that little marathon of coordinate geometry. <laughs> <laughs> that should be player x plus half the width. Because we decided in this example that the x and y coordinate were going to be the center of it. And then we got our player. Oh my god. After all of that. All right, so I'll leave that code up for a second, right? If anyone wants to take it down, I'm sure you came up with your own solutions, which were just as good as that, okay? I just thought really quickly just work them out, you know? But um, the purpose of this is to just to let you start thinking about, you know, numbers again, and how we add and subtract and multiply numbers to get the, the numbers that we're looking for. What's that? So, let me just get half stroke and fill. 
No, no, sorry, just try to keep the whole Oh, yeah, you see the little layer next to me? We can get that target to zero, actually zero. What you need to do, because with the light, don't get sent until after. So, it's, so what I typically do here is, you can see in my example, I, well, don't declare them after. So what you do is declare them here, and then assign them in set. So just declare them here, which says these are global variables, but only give them their values after you call them size in the setup method. What about that? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so the next, the next uh, challenge that we have is write the if statement to move the ship. If you have the ship drawn relative to the x and y coordinates, then you need three if statements. You need an if statement to check for the left key, an if statement to check for the right key. So that's only two if statements. So only two if statements we need, and then hopefully we should be able to get our player to move, okay? So I'll leave that code up for a second, and then try and write the if statements, yeah? Yeah. Okay, well everyone just look up for a second. Everybody, just look up because I, I want to explain this to you and there's a lot of very important, what, what I suppose you call gotchas, okay? Mistakes that people make very commonly when they're, particularly in their first year of programming, these are the kind of common mistakes people will make, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just flag them for you now, right? So that you know when they happen, you'll, have, uh, you'll know how to fix them. Okay, so the first thing, we're going to make if key pressed. Now, you could go equals equals to true, okay? That's, that's okay. A lot of times people like to write their code like that, but it's not necessary because key pressed is equals to true. If you evaluate key pressed and it's equals to true, then what's key pressed equals equals to true? Okay, if key pressed is true and key pressed equals equals to true, does that evaluate to true or false? False. If key pressed is true, true. True. It will evaluate to true. So the whole thing has to evaluate to true, right? So, you know, key pressed is equals equals to true is the same as saying key pressed, because key pressed is either true or false. So true equals true is true. False equals true is false. False. Okay. So well, that's what you're saying. You know, you're saying is true equals to true. You might as well just say is key pressed is true. Next thing. Um, a, a very common rule, right? So we're used to always putting a semicolon at the end of every statement in processing and programming. Okay. There, there is an exception to that rule, and the exception to that rule is whenever the subsequent line starts with an open curly bracket you don't put a semicolon. And the reason for that is because if you put a semicolon here, it disconnects this block from the if statement. Right? What that means is it will always do this block of code regardless. And, and the two things don't become connected anymore. So you disconnect them like this. What this is basically saying is, if key pressed, <laughs> nothing. And then this block of code now is not connected to the if statement. You see what I mean? So a very common mistake people make is they go, if key press semicolon, they go, why is it always doing the thing that it's supposed to do only when I press the key? And like I say, the reason why is because this semicolon disconnects this block from the if statement. So that block is just like any other line of code now, it's not connected to the if statement. So we go, if key pressed. And then what we want to do is we want to put the, the next bit in here. So now I know a key has been pressed, now I need to check the next phase, which is to check to see which key was pressed. So then we go if key, another very important thing when we're comparing things in programming, and I want to compare things to see if something equals to something else, you use double equals. Do you remember this? Did I mention this before? Double equals means you compare two things to check for equality. It doesn't mean an assignment. Single equals is an assignment. And again, it's a very common mistake. I make the mistake myself even from time to time. So then we check the keys. So let's just do A, for example, like that. And if the A key is pressed, another very important thing. You don't, strictly speaking, if you're only doing one statement, if I'm only doing one line of code here, then I don't, strictly speaking, need these open and curly, close curly brackets. However, if I ever see anybody doing an if statement and not putting open and close curly brackets after them, there will be trouble. Because we always, we always, good programmers always open a block after an if statement, okay? It's, it's the rule, it's the rules on this course. And if I see people doing it, what will happen? 
Right. You'd be awesome. off the course. <laughs> right. Wow. The authority. I feel that strongly about it, right? So if the key is equal to A, you go player X minus minus. If the key is equal to D, open the curly bracket, close the curly bracket. All right, if we want to do a course, you could do a speed variable there. You know, you could say that uh, player x plus equals to speed and player y and uh, player x minus equals to speed, and then you will, you'll uh, be able to control the speed of the player. But now, hopefully we should have the, the A key and the D key now are moving the player. So it's checking the key, and then it is adjusting the value for player x and player y depending, right? So that's the structure of what's called the nested if statement. So I've got one if statement. If this is true, it will then go on and do these other two bits of the if statement. If I wanted to change this to use the arrow keys, you could just do the word left in uppercase and the word right. These are just other ways of, um, these, these, these are kind of constants because you can't really do single quotes to the left arrow, single quotes to the right arrow. So these. These are like constants which are built into processing, which allow you to check the keys. Yeah. Uh, what about spacebar? Spacebar, I think, will work with a single quote, press the space, and then another single quote. Okay. Yeah, because that's actually um, it's actually a character, you know. Uh, yeah. Left and right didn't work for us. Yeah. Really tried to and it didn't do it at all. Didn't do anything. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I think when you're doing left and right, you have to use a different variable, key code. No. Uh, yeah, I think that will work, okay, if you're using left and right. Yeah, okay. So just a quick recap on that, because it is really important. No semicolon at the end of an if statement. Always follow on the next line with an open curly bracket. If you get into the habit of doing this now, it will kind of just stand you for uh, you know all the code that you're going to write, you know when we get more programs get more complicated. But get into good habits of laying out your code like this on the screen. Open curly bracket, indent your code one tab, close curly bracket. See that your your curly brackets line up. These curly brackets line up. I can see these two line up as well. And then this one is lining up at the end of the page. All right. So why don't we take like a five minute break and we'll come back and we'll make the bulls and we'll make the collisions. <laughs> Okay, compound if statements. Everybody look up for a second, right? This is how the compound if statements work. So if the key code is left, uh, currently I'm moving the player to the left, but I only want to move the player to the left if the player hasn't hit the left bound of the screen. So I can basically say if the key code is left and something else is true, I should have probably allowed you to guess whether it should be and, but it's, it's and the player x has to be greater than half width All right, so both of those things have to be true for me to be allowed to move left so have a look up on that and see does it make sense, right? I don't say player x is greater than zero because, you know, otherwise the player would be able to move halfway across the screen because we said the player X was the center point of the player, right? So what I want to do is, if you look at the little, if I just, to just draw it for you. Okay. Like we'll say, here's the extreme left-hand corner of the screen. Here's the player. You see that here the player X and Y coordinate you know, they haven't reached zero at this point. Instead, there's still a distance of half the player's width to go before it reaches the extreme left of the screen. So you can check to see if the player's x coordinate is greater than half the width, you allow them to continue to move. If they reach this point here, like if I start to go off the screen, you don't allow them to move left anymore. So you can check to see are both of those things true. So in other words, the, the key has to be pressed and the player has to be still on the screen, and then you can let them move left. So this is called a compound if state, because we're checking two things at once. It's very important that everybody um, understands the syntax, right? When you're checking more than one thing at the same time in an if statement, 
you have to specify it quite long-windedly like this. So you check key code is equals to the left, and this is just one bit of it, so this has to be true. And then this bit here also has to be true, and if both of them are true, then it will do the thing that's inside the, um, the, the block here. An interesting thing here, everybody, this is a really cool little feature that you can occasionally exploit to your benefit, right? If the key code is not equals to left, the computer never even checks this bit over here. Because both of them have to be true for the output to be true. So it realizes if one of them is false, there's no point in checking the rest of the if statement. It never even bothers to check that. All right, so sometimes we can use that to our advantage, right? Just, just, just keep it in mind for now. Let's just make sure that this works. If the key code is right, and the player x is less than the width of the screen minus half the width of the player, then we allow the player to move to the right. So let's just double check to make sure that that works before we move on. So now I'm going to press the right arrow, and as soon as I reach the end of the screen, oh, it stops. Because it no lo now no longer is allowing me to move to the right because my, my right body is too far. And then if I go all the way over to the left, There we go. It won't allow me to go all the way over to the left. As soon as I get to the left, it stops. So that's how you do what's called a compound if statement. You check two things at once inside an if statement. Um, in computer science, we have this concept of what's called a truth table. I'll just show you what a truth table looks like, right? They're quite interesting and rather obvious ways of kind of understanding how AND and OR works, right? The symbol for AND is this, two of these. And the symbol for OR, because lots of times we want to check if this is true, or this is true, or this is true. We use this symbol here. Can you remember what we call this symbol? Yeah, this means OR, but we've got two of them together. When a single one, what do we call it? The actual symbol? It's called a pipe symbol. Okay, so this single symbol here, you've got a single vertical bar is called a pipe. These things here are called ampersands, okay? There's one other symbol. I remember I told you this one definitely. It's called a bang symbol, and that means not. Because sometimes you want to check if this is true, and this is not equals to, or this is not true. So you can specify not using this one here. I think next week, you know, it might be a good idea for us to just write those of if statements, just to make sure we get some practice at drawing all those different things. Now that we kind of have used it in, in actual making a little game. Um, here's what the truth table looks like. Right, just take out a pen and paper and see if you can fill out the rest of this, right? Say I have two booleans, A and B. So I want to say A and B. <coughs> so we write out all the possible values for A and B. So if I said that A was false, B was false, then A becomes true, B is false, and then we have true and true. You know, write out what you think the value for A and B, these two symbols. When you add them together, if they're both false, A and B will be? True. False. So, okay, a great way to think about this is to imagine it in English, right? And think of an English scenario here. So, let me see. Um, an English scenario for this, right? Say, two things have to be true for the output to be true. Say, Um, think of a good example. Okay, so say you got um, yeah, say you're going to drive a car, right? So, for in order for you to drive a car, two things have to be true. There has to be petrol in the car, and you have to turn the key in the ignition. If there's no petrol in the car and you turn the need key in the ignition, what happens? The car won't drive. If you have petrol but you don't turn the key in the ignition, will the car drive? No, so they both have to be true for the output to be true. Do you follow? Yeah. So in this example here, A is false, B is false, A and B. False. False. It's false. 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 Okay, this is like the scenario where there's no petrol in the car and there's no key in the ignition, so the car won't drive. Do you follow? Yeah. If A is true and B is false, false. it's false. And if A is true and B is true, <coughs> it's true. So we get this structure here, so we've got, um, yeah, we've missed one element here, you know. That should be, of course, true, false, 
and then false, true, and then true, true. So then this should be false, and then this should be true. So it's got four elements. Very interesting thing here would be if I had three elements here, how many rows would my table have? If I had three, it would have Work it out. Do it. Every combination and see. Just work it out on pen and paper. Do A, B, and C. A and B and C. And then count out how many different combinations of A, B, and C you have. If you have a pen and paper, just work it out. If you have three different variables you want to check, you would have. Eight. Eight. It's always two to the power of the number of um, variables, right? So in this case, we have three variables. You've got two to the power of three is eight. So it's two multiplied by two multiplied by two. If we had four variables, how many rows would we have? Sixteen. If we had eight, sorry, if we had five, how many would we have? If we had eight, how many would we have? Two to the power of eight. Two hundred fifty-six. Uh, yeah, 2 to the power of 8 is not 64. Type it into your calculator. 2 to the power of 2 x 2 x 2 x 2 x 2 8 times. It's a magic number. It's what we call a magic number in computers. It's a number you're all going to be very familiar with. 256. 256. 2 to the power of 8 is 256. 2 to the power of 16. 2 to the power of 32. Four billion. Is it 4 billion or something? Yeah, roughly 4 billion. How much RAM can you install on a Windows 32 computer before it won't take any more RAM? 4 gigs. That's why. Because the registers are 32 bits wide. So that's the maximum number of memory that a Windows 32 computer can address is, uh, is 4 gigabytes of RAM. That's the reason why, because it's 2 to the power of 32. But anyway, that's just a little aside. Um, but it's important. I think it's important that you guys know some computer science stuff as well. This is computer science kind of a concept. If we were to do the same thing for OR, if we go A pipe pipe OR, and then we say false and false, A or B will be false. Okay, A or B true. will be true. 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 Is the last one true or false? True. 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 Alright, so that's how OR works, right? So the way OR works is, you might like to think, if it's raining, or I wash my car, my car gets wet. So either one of the two things can happen for your car to get wet. Do you understand? If they both happen, is the car wet? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's very wet. Double wet. So that's this is how come this is how OR works, okay? Um, so there we go. In this example here, this thing evaluates the true, and this thing has to be true. So both of these things have to be true. In which case, we'll do this. Anyway, I think maybe we should uh, draw the bug. What do you reckon? Okay, let's draw the bug. Same approach for drawing the bug as for drawing the player. Use the two variables. There was one last thing I wanted to show. Actually, it's not too important. You can figure it out without it. It's not actually necessary. No, it would take too long to explain now. I was going to show you how to do things like not every frame, but say every 30 frames, you know? Because we don't want the book to move every frame, we want it to move every 30 frames. Yeah, but it's cool, there's lots of ways to solve it. Let me switch off the video.